Welcome everyone to the Melanoma Research Foundation's educational webinar this evening. My name is Sarah Selig. Together with my husband, Greg, we co-founded the CureOM initiative, and I'm currently the director of the initiative at the Melanoma Research Foundation. And I'm joined tonight by Miriam Kadosh, the director of education and patient engagement at the MRF. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Miriam to kick us off tonight. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. It is so wonderful to be with you all this evening. Thank you for joining us. We hope to continue to provide meaningful educational and supportive programming and opportunities for all of you. So please do not hesitate to reach out to me at any point. Um, my email address is education at melanoma.org. I'll say it again, education at melanoma.org. Before we get started with our program tonight, I just want to share a few um, of our Cure OM uh, pro specific programming that will be coming up and is available to you in the next few weeks month, and months. Um, so I want you to please be aware of our support groups that run the first Wednesday of the month and the fourth Friday of the month. Please reach out to me if you'd like more information. Additionally, please be on the lookout because this November, next month, we will have our hashtag I Get Dilated campaign. And be sure to interact with us on social media, um, wherever you follow us, whether that be Facebook, Instagram, um, and you can follow us at Cure Melanoma on Instagram and on Facebook at Cure Ocular Melanoma. Lastly, save the date for our ocular, ocular melanoma patient meeting. It will be in May, May 2nd through 5th in Boston, Massachusetts. And we will also have a special um, Miles for Melanoma in Boston that uh, weekend as well. So we'd love to have you out for all of those wonderful events. But again, please do, do uh, feel free to reach out to me and uh, at education at melanoma.org. And we will get on with our program. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Miriam. We, again, we're pleased to have you join us um, tonight for this educational opportunity entitled Newly Approved Liver-Directed Treatment for Uveal Melanoma. The goal today is to discuss and learn more about the latest FDA-approved drug for metastatic uveal melanoma, Melphalan delivered directly to the liver. Our mission at the Melanoma Research Foundation is to eradicate melanoma by accelerating research while educating to and advocating for the melanoma community. We know that education is critical for patients to make informed decisions about their care, and it's important to us that you get this information tonight. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. We encourage you to use the Q&A box to ask questions throughout the session. The information presented today um, during the session is for educational purposes only, and any individual treatment questions should be directed to your um, individual healthcare providers and teams. We encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org and curom.org to learn more about the resources we have available. And also, this session will be available for viewing later for folks who miss it in real time or if you want to review it again if you've missed something. Um, so please feel free to share the recording um, with others when it's available. So tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Jonathan Zager. Unfortunately, Dr. Marlena Orloff had an emergency and is no longer able to, to be here. She sends her um, regrets. Dr. Jonathan Zager is the Chief Academic Officer and a Surgical Oncologist and Senior Member in the Departments of Cutaneous Oncology and Sarcoma at Moffitt Cancer Center. Dr. Zager is the Director of Regional Therapies at Moffitt's Donald A. Adam Comprehensive Melanoma Research Center. Dr. Zager is the chair of the Department of Oncologic Sciences and a professor of surgery and the university, at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine. Dr. Zager's research and clinical interests include the regional therapy, treatment of cutaneous melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers soft and soft tissue sarcomas. And it is a real pleasure to have um, Dr. Zager here Today, his accomplishments we can't capture um, in his bio, but just on a personal note, um, Dr. Zager has just been a real champion for the ocular melanoma community and for patients, um, particularly with metastatic uveal melanoma. And um, we're very grateful to you, Dr. Zager, for all of your work and for being here tonight to help us learn more about this um, newly approved treatment. Well, thanks for the 
um, the kind welcome and introduction. So uh, as you mentioned, yeah, my, my plan tonight is just to go over this newly approved treatment. And I'm going to share my screen because I do have a, a bunch of slides. Um, it'll be easier to present it in, in slide format and then happy to answer any questions that everyone or anyone might have afterwards. So um, recently in August of this year, after about 15 years and two phase three trials, percutaneous hepatic perfusion was approved by the FDA as the only liver directed therapy approved for uveal melanoma metastatic to the liver. And I had the opportunity to lead the clinical trial. So it was, it was a long time in, uh, in, the, in the process to get it um, approved, but it was an amazing day when the FDA finally said, um, said it's what it said it was approved. So um, as you can see here on the slide, and most of you probably know this better than I do, that ocular melanoma is pretty rare. It accounts for less than 5% of all melanoma cases. It's about 3,400 new cases in the US each year. It's the second most common type of melanoma after cutaneous. And there are two major subtypes. There's uveal and there's conjunctival. Uveal melanoma is the vast majority. It's about up to 90% of all ocular melanoma cases. Um, and as you know, the liver is the most common site and usually the dominant site or sole site of distant metastases in up to 95% of the cases. So what is percutaneous hepatic perfusion or hepzido? Um, so percutaneous hepatic perfusion is a uh, technique that uniquely isolates and treats the entire uh, liver. This therapy isolates the liver circulation and delivers a high dose of chemotherapy directly to the liver, treating the entire organ, not just one or two little areas that might have radiographic or radiologic evidence of disease, but all the microscopic disease that might be in the liver. It delivers a super high concentration of chemotherapy called melphalan, and then it filters out this chemotherapy outside the body prior to returning it to the patient. So as you can see here, the liver is isolated with a double balloon catheter. That balloon catheter, as you can see, is fed up through the groin, through the femoral vein, the vein in your groin, up into uh, the liver, and the balloons are inflated above and below, effectively isolating the effluent that comes in from the liver, the venous return from the systemic circulation. Another catheter is fed up into the artery, into the liver, and that's your inflow catheter, and that's where the chemo is infused into. So now the chemo is infused through this arterial catheter. The balloons prevent the, the chemo from getting anywhere else. In between the balloons are some fenestrations in the catheter. That's actively pumped out of your body, all the chemo-laden blood, filtered outside the body. As you can see here in the bottom right, there's two filters. And then the chemo-filtered blood is returned to the patient through another catheter in their neck. So it really has this extracorporeal outside the body, veno-veno bypass, bypasses from the vein, to another vein so all the blood can make itself back to the make it back to the heart. There was a previous phase 3 trial that I also participated on and ended in 2012 and you can see the results that are shown on the slide here. In that trial we took liver dominant or liver um, uh, only disease and we looked at hepatic progression-free survival, the, the progression of any disease inside the liver, as well as overall progression-free survival in the liver or outside the liver. And when we compared percutaneous hepatic perfusion to best alternative care, which was investigator's choice back in the first phase three trial, you can see there was a almost a quadrupling of the progression-free survival benefit in favor of P PHP. Overall progression-free survival was almost tripled, again, in favor of PHP versus any best alternative care. Um, at that point, though, there was the first generation filters. This wasn't approved for a variety of reasons by the FDA back in 2012. So we designed a new phase three trial with a second generation of filters um, and that those results I'm going to show in a moment. 
If you look at this graph here, the percutaneous, and this is again from the first phase three, tumor control rate. So stable disease versus some response was about 80% compared to any best alternative care um, was about 43%. So almost double the best alternative care. And again, response rates, um, overall response in the liver was 36% versus 2% and overall response um, uh, outside, uh, I'm sorry, overall response rates in total was 23, 27% versus 4.1%, sorry. So then we designed this new phase three trial. Part of the old phase three trial is that there wasn't a survival benefit. And the reason why there wasn't a survival benefit is anybody on the best alternative care arm that failed, they progressed, they were able to switch over and get percutaneous hepatic perfusion. And that PHP then rescued a lot of patients, therefore improving the survival of the patients on best alternative care, confounding the results. And there, uh, it turned out that there was no survival benefit because of that. So we designed a new trial, a non-crossover trial. And this was the current phase three trial that led to the FDA approval in, in August. Here again, you had percutaneous hepatic perfusion randomly assigned versus best alternative care. But now instead of the investigator's choice, we looked at four different options, pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, which are immunotherapies, tocarbazine, which is a chemotherapy or chemoembolization. And that was randomly assigned one-to-one -one against PHP. It began as this randomized trial the best alternative care arm was those, those four choices you can see there. And there was very slow enrollment due to patient reluctance to receive best alternative care treatment. And, you know, patients come to us educated. So they knew about the first phase three trial. They knew about the tripling or quadrupling of results over best alternative care. And they were very reluctant to, to um, receive the BAC arm. And some patients were actually flying to Europe where this is CE mark. It's like the FDA CE mark approved in Europe as standard of care. So they were flying to Europe and actually paying for the treatments. So because um, of this kind of uh, reluctancy and slow um, accrual to the best alternative care, we talked to the FDA, FDA and it was amended to a single arm trial. The current single arm trial was then called the 301A, as you can see on the bottom of the chart. Um, and it was just a single arm trial. And anybody who um, signed up that was a candidate would get PHP. So PHP patients could receive up to six individual treatments. They were repeated every six to eight weeks. So it's almost about a year's worth of therapy once you're, once you're in the trial. The malflan, which is the cytotoxic chemotherapy, is dosed at a super high level at three milligrams per kilogram and then corrected for ideal body weight. Patients with hepatic or extra hepatic progressive disease were um, discontinued from the study, and every patient was followed until um, death of any cause. Patients were imaged with um, CT scans and MRIs every 12 weeks. And the primary endpoint was overall response rate assessed by an independent review committee. So we didn't have any say in what looks like a response or not. Um, you needed at least two evaluable response time points um, to be included in the results seen below. So if you look at the study participant disposition by enrollment and treatment, 102 patients um, got PHP best alternative care arm before it was uh, changed to a single arm study, 42 patients got best alternative care. Of those patients, 91 and 32 were actually treated. 123 patients in total were treated. The demographics on the pot bottom right, you can see um, the median age was 62 years. Uh, it was pretty much half and half male and female. And the time since the diagnosis of liver metastases was about five months in PHP versus two and a half months in best alternative care. So we actually got the um, patients in best alternative care onto treatment a little bit more, uh, a little more quickly. Um, despite that, you're going to see some results now. So the best overall response in the treated population, there was seven, about 8% patients had a complete response in PHP versus none in best alternative care. 
33.3% in total had a response in the PHP arm versus 12.5 in the best alternative care. Um, stable disease, again, stable disease is non-progression in another about 38% of patients in PHP versus 25 in best alternative care. Um, and as you can see, this wasn't, um, it was significantly different in terms of the Fisher's test between the two arms. But remember, we stopped this randomized trial a little early. So then we're going to look at overall response rate and disease control rate in both populations. Again, about 36.3% overall response rate in PHP versus that 12.5%. And I realize I have a, this is supposed to be 36.3 over there. Disease control rate, almost 75% in PHP versus about 38% in best alternative care. Again, significantly in favor, both of those, in favor of getting PHP. Progression-free survival was tripled in the um, PHP group, nine months in PHP versus three months best alternative care. Um, again, this was significantly in favor of um, the patients who got PHP. These plots are called waterfall plots. And as you can see here, the downward ticks in the, auto, in the waterfall plots represent tumor response. Anything that's below that dotted line that you can see on your screen is an evaluable response, meaning it's counted as a response on the trial. So there are some patients that go between zero and minus 25 on both arms that aren't necessarily counted as a responder. Um, they're counted as stable disease. But when you compare the two waterfall plots, obviously you can see at least half of best alternative care is an uptick or about a fifth or a quarter of all the patients um, in best uh, percent change were actually progressors in the PHP arm. The duration of response is important. Median duration of response before any signs of progression was 14 months in PHP. Patients with confirmed CR or PR, again, at two different um, evaluable time points, 33 patients in PHP and four in best alternative care. Patients with subsequent progression of disease out of those 33 and four are 16 and one. Um, and now you can see like it's just some uh, radiographs of patients that I've treated in the, in the trial. And so the first one here is a 65 year old male. He only received two PHPs. Um, I just saw him a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago. So I would say he's about at almost three or four years out. So these are old pictures. Um, and you can see he had a lesion here in his liver that circled in red after the first um, PHP, that lesion is getting smaller. And after the second PHP, it's pretty much disappeared. So he had a radiographic complete response that lasted about four years. Um, so if this was 20 months at the time of 2021, it's been about just over 24 months since then. So it's about four years. Another patient of mine, 73-year-old female, she had six percutaneous hepatic perfusions and she had a partial response. So you can see these big lesions in the left side of her liver, which is the center of your screen, getting smaller. And she did progress in a little nodule just outside of her belly muscular wall that we resected um, about uh, a year, 20 months, two years after her first PHP. And she, I just saw her a few weeks ago as well. And she still has um, some minor amounts of disease, but uh, again, about four or five years out from the start of treatment. Every therapy, no matter what you do, has adverse events. Serious adverse events that occurred in greater than 5% of PHP patients are seen here. And the majority of the patients that get an adverse event are going to have bone marrow suppression. This is usually just observed, not actively treated. We do give a shot of Nulasta, which is a um, growth factor. The day after discharge, patients usually go home the day after the procedure. The next day, they get a shot of Nulasta. And that helps to counteract any of the bone marrow suppression. Um, I would say in my, you know, treating, doing this hundreds of times, the overwhelming vast majority of patients go home day one after the procedure and they're back to work or normal life by the following week, um, pretty much without exception. And most of these adverse events are just um, treated with observation and really no active um, treatment necessary. 
So in summary, uh, PHP is definitely well tolerated. These patients go home day one. The most common adverse events are those that are uh, bone marrow suppression. Um, these are manageable as an outpatient with observation in the majority of patients. Uh, the data from this current trial shows an improvement over the previous phase three study, and it might be just that we're using better filters now. There are higher overall response rates, longer progression-free survival. There's lower toxicity observed. There's no treatment-related deaths in our trial. The overall response rate was nearly three times better than um, best alternative care, 36.3% versus 12.5%. Disease control rate was a doubled in favor of PHP, so 70, about 75% versus about 38%. And progression-free survival was nearly tripled nine months versus three months. So it showed a statistically significant advantage over BAC, best alternative care, in all three of these, overall response, disease control, and progression-free survival. PHP patients had durable responses lasting an average of 14 months. Adverse events were well described and manageable, and it really offers a uh, this option for patients with this rare indication that's now FDA approved, associated with what historically is a poor prognosis, but hopefully now um, giving patients some some hope and some some options, uh, considering that this will be available hopefully by the end of the year or the beginning of the uh, of next year on the shelf as standard of care, and there are numerous centers in the country right now that are um, offering it on an expanded access protocol. So it's, it's available for patients now as well. And with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen. I can always go back to it if you guys want to see any slides. And I'm happy to answer any questions from the audience or Sarah or uh, Miriam. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that was a um, really helpful overview. I do have a number of questions um, that I will send your way if that's okay. And some of the questions actually I think you've touched on, but maybe I'll just ask them again um, and maybe we can expand on some of these a little bit um, more. So the first question, um, again, um, not being able to speak to any one individual patient, could you just speak a little bit to um, what you think about when you're evaluating a patient um, for this treatment, of course, we know not every treatment um, is going to, you know, ev not every right. pa patient is going to be eligible for every treatment. So what, right. what kind of criteria do you um, think about when you're evaluating if a patient is appropriate for this? So we evaluate patients. We have to make sure that they're cardiovascularly fit. They have no major cardiac or pulmonary problems. Um, patients need to have adequate liver function, meaning that they don't have any uh, liver abnormalities. Um, one person asked what percentage of tumor burden was accepted for the trial. So anything that's 50% or less liver involvement is accepted. So that's a pretty significant tumor burden. Um, we also look at external disease, extra hepatic disease, sorry. So there was another question about treatment available for patients who have metastases outside the liver. So if the metastases outside the liver are treated stable and they've demonstrated stability, or there are minimal uh, lesions outside the liver, then we can consider putting patients on um, percutaneous hepatic perfusion and following those lesions. Or sometimes if there's a one or two extra hepatic outside the liver lesions, we'll do some stereotactic radiation in between PHP one and two and kind of just zap those extra hepatic meds. Um, I'm just going through the questions. I don't know if you want to, or there's another question about HLA status. It does not matter here. Um, and you do not have to be treatment naive. However, in my opinion, PHP doesn't burn the bridge for another therapy, right? So we don't burn the bridge for systemic therapy for Dabontafusp, which someone was alluding to with uh, HLA status or Kimtrak. Um, however, sometimes going on systemic therapy can burn the bridge for PHP because if you start with systemic therapy or other types of therapy and your liver disease progresses, and then now you have more than 50% involvement in your liver, whereas before you didn't, then PHP is no longer an option. So 
I think that if my opinion and my bias is to start with PHP early, treat these patients, and if it fails and it doesn't work in everyone, I just showed you the data, if it fails, we have other options. The reverse might not be true. Um, so I'm, do you want me to come and go through the questions or do you um, want to go through them? Yeah, go ahead. I'll interrupt you. I have a couple here that I'll, um, that if they fit in, I'll just interject. So All keep right. going on a roll. Given how resource intensive the therapy, what is a reasonable maximal number of treatments one center can comfortably do? Also, will there be backup training docs? Uh, I can't answer that question. It depends on the center. I did one today. I have one tomorrow. I have one in two weeks and one the week after that. So we're doing four. We had five. One person declined to go on therapy for the month of October. And yes, there are definitely backup trained docs, um, including we're training one of my partners to help out with this. So I'm not the only person at Moffitt doing it. Um, when you say durable response of 14 months, liver lesions come back at 14 months or so, can you then resume treatment? So as this becomes standard of care, we can do whatever we want. So if you've responded and the lesions look like they're stable and they're stable for 14 months or more, and then they start to progress, I don't see why we can't start the treatment again on these patients. Right now in the expanded access trial, and on the phase three, that wasn't possible. But when it's standard care on the shelves, a lot of these nuances from the clinical trial don't need to be necessarily followed. Um, it doesn't have to be so rigid. Is it an option if you already been treated with chemoembolization? Yes, it is. But again, I would use this therapy first. Um, it's definitely an option, but you know, if you're treated with chemoembo and then immunoembo, and then this is going to be now third line, then my assumption is you're progressing in your liver. Um, Hepzato and Chemtrac being used together might be the future. I've um, suggested some investigator initiated studies with the um, company and we're in discussions right now to try to think about what the next steps are in combining therapies. I think their focus right now is to, to get this on the shelves as quick as possible so patients can benefit from it. And once they have a couple of centers up and running, then we can start talking about the next steps. Can you have a PHP after a resection? The answer to that is yes, depending on how much of a resection was, was done in the liver and how recent the resection was. Um, can you expand on that just a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, you have to have a certain volume of liver and a certain volume to disease ratio in order to um, be a candidate. So, and if you had any sort of like Whipple procedure and varied anatomy because of the resection, then this might not be technically feasible. We have to get a bunch of catheters in there, including a big catheter in the IVC. And if things are distorted, then the technical aspect of the actual procedure might not be feasible. So we take that on an individual basis. Can I interject here? And this is a question sure. um, related to access and patient screening. You spoke a little bit to the timing of access, but what can people expect in terms of, um, could you just speak again to the timing of access and, you know, kind of looking ahead what your guess is in terms of geographic access. And for example, right now, um, if patients wanna be evaluated at the centers that currently provide this treatment, um, how can patients be evaluated? Do they have to travel if they don't live in the area? Um, do these yeah. some centers review scans remotely? Could you just kind of sure to access sort of across the board over from now so over the next year? Access is going to change over the next three months, probably, right? So right now it's only on an expanded access protocol. So everything is very rigid. It's an FDA approved protocol. There are no real, you know, ways of going around it. You have to be evaluated at the center that's going to treat you. You have to have your scans there. There are a lot of labs that are, you know, continue to look at safety and all that. And it's really, it's somewhat burdensome for the patient. And I can say that, you know, most of my patients aren't from Tampa. They're from all over the country. As far as after the first of the year, let's use that as the next target date. There are centers popping up all over the country that are being currently proctored by my center. They come, they visit, they watch a case or two, then we will go to them. There's a bunch of proctors that will start teaching them how to do it. 
So my assumption is and hope that we'll have a dozen or so centers dotted across the country um, starting in the beginning of the year that will be offering it. Right now, there are only three centers offering this, Moffitt, um, UT Memphis, and uh, Duke. So those are the three centers that are up and running on the expanded access protocol. Um, and patients would get a referral to one of those centers from their local... Yeah, I mean, as soon as you're diagnosed with liver metastases, you can self-refer, you can get a referral, but you do have to be evaluated with specific tests, scans, labs, and all that to be eligible for the um, for the clinical trial. Again, that will change a little bit come standard of care. It'll be less stringent, but right now you need to be um, evaluated to be eligible. Um, someone asked about liver injury, not on the list of adverse events. I didn't say it wasn't an adverse event. There's no injury per se, um, but there weren't um, more than 5% serious adverse events of LFT elevation. That's why it wasn't listed. Um, severe thrombocytopenia. Uh, some patients who have a very major leak of chemotherapy that we can't control with the balloons and the filters because they have some varied anatomy, might get some thrombocytopenia that resulted in them being excluded from the trial. But again, in real life, I don't have to target six to eight weeks. If it takes 12 weeks or 14 weeks for that patient to bounce back, we can consider doing another treatment after that. Um, in the trial, they'd be excluded. In real life, we can take it on a patient by patient basis. Um, is it worth having after removal of a solitary MET to ensure there are no other METs? So in my opinion, you should never have surgery um, for ocular melanoma metastatic to the liver. It's a miliary disease, meaning it's dotted all around the liver. Whether you can see it or not, that is the natural history. Going in there to resect a portion of the liver is probably not the right thing to do. And it just sets patients back while they recover from surgery for what will likely be inevitable that they will pop up with further disease. So treating the whole liver or systemic therapies or liver directed therapies are the way to go. Um, Dr. Zager, just in case, I'm not sure um, if that question came from somebody who has had a resection of a solitary lesion and they're asking if it would be worth having this procedure after that to ensure right. if that would help. Yeah. So I, if you were sitting in my office right now, I would have to wait till you add evidence of visible lesions on imaging to do the procedure. So not in an adjuvant setting per se after it was removed, but as a treatment setting, in my opinion, you're going to recur probably in the liver and the remnant of the liver. And I've seen it too many times. Um, so eventually that patient might be a candidate. Once the disease showed up on scans again is when Correct. you would recommend that. Treatment. Correct. Okay. Yeah. The earliest sign of scans showing disease. Are you investigating quality of life on an ongoing basis? Uh, no, I'm not. But I can tell you of doing this again, hundreds of times, the quality of life is pretty good. These patients go home day one. They're back to work doing what they want to do by week one after the procedure. And can you expand, can you, exp you've, you've mentioned that patients go home day one, they're back to work the following week. Could you just expand on the patient experience a little bit more, how much prep they need, how many visits to you ahead of time? And then typically they're overnight in the hospital a night. And then we've heard a little bit about the adverse events, but kind of what are the typical side effects that, that people experience during that time? Uh, okay, so expanded access trial and phase three trial and real world standard of care are going to be different. Right now on the trial, you're admitted the day before real world, you'll be admitted the day of the procedure. Um, right now, uh, you go home day one and in real world, you'll probably go home day one, you stay over in the ICU one night, you get discharged straight from the ICU. As far as adverse effects, you might be tired for a few days um, just because of the procedure itself, but usually there are no visible or tangible adverse effects that the patient can describe other than being a little tired, 
Um, the procedure is not painful. Uh, labs are really silent, right? You don't know your labs are deranged unless there's a major problem or you don't know if they're abnormal. And um, oftentimes they're not that abnormal. So um, you really wouldn't know that you had abnormal labs if we didn't draw them. Um, that's about it. The, the real, the quality of life, in my opinion, now I haven't had it done to me, um, maybe with the next Melanoma Research Foundation, we can have one of my patients talk, but I think their quality of life is pretty good. Um, another patient asked about washout periods. Right now, chemoembolization is uh, uh, 30 days washout period and any immunotherapy, systemic therapy like ChemTrac or Ipinevo is eight weeks. That might change, that will change in standard of care. Um, probably keep it at 30 days for either of them, chemoembolization or systemic therapy. Right now on the trial, it's eight weeks for systemic therapy. Uh, is PHP different than chemostat? No, chemosat. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. It's just called chemosat in Europe, I think. PHP is what I call it. And um, Hepzado is what the FDA and everybody else calls it. Are Canadians eligible? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it would depend on insurance. And um, because the clinical trial pays for some and insurance pays for others, uh, other types of uh, other portions of the therapy. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, FDA approved, are you finding any difficulties with insurance? So we haven't started standard of care yet. We'll know that by the first of the year, but I'm anticipating hopefully not. Um, off-label use for other liver-dominant cancers or would your center only perform? Yeah, it might be. We might use it off-label for other liver-dominant cancers as it's uh, on the shelf. But again, to do so, we need some sort of permission from the insurance company to, to go ahead and, and use it off-label. So that will be a patient-by-patient -patient individual discussion and in insurance. And then the last question, is this a plan B? I'm not sure I understand that question, Trisalis. And is I, this a plan B? I'm not sure if that is asking if, uh, or maybe a way to interpret that would be, um, and you've spoken to this a little bit, how you would approach different liver directed um, therapies. Um, and you know, that may go back to individual patients um, and their clinical situation and um, and individual factors specific to a patient um, and their family and something I think to to discuss with individual providers um, and yeah. really think about each individual's situation. Yeah. I mean, every patient is different. Every patient has their unique, you know, issues, travel, disease burden, comorbidities. So, uh, you know, this is definitely a, um, an option, but might not be an option for everyone. Um, some oncologists want pathology for tumor DNA. Is it possible to biopsy at the time of PHP? The answer is no. I'm not sticking a hole in a lesion and then putting chemotherapy in the liver and fully heparinizing a patient and, you know, um, putting that patient at risk for bleeding or any other problems during the procedure, but absolutely would help set up a biopsy a week or two before the procedure without a problem. Actually, as a matter of fact, we at Moffitt have a, um, uh, a uh, tissue protocol that we'd love to get some patients on as well. Age limit, no. Um, perhaps you don't know, but how do you cost comparison? It's going to probably be around the same cost, but that's something to ask the company. May you answer this? How fast do you expect the treatment to be available? First of the year. And that I'm assuming also, um, we'll be hearing updates, uh, on availability and, 
Um, that will be available on our website and other websites, the company's Fine. website, et cetera. I think that that information will be forthcoming um, and we'll make sure the patient community is aware of that as well. Jefferson will be offering it. And I wish Marlena was on the, uh, Dr. Orloff was on the call tonight. Um, they are not participating on the expanded access protocol for one reason or the other, but they will be um, offering the procedure as standard of care when, once it's available. And again, I would, if I had to pick a date, I would shoot for the first of the year for that. The company's working as fast as they can to get this available to as many patients as they can, as quickly as they can. Dr. Zager, do you think any, are there any questions that we missed that patients typically ask you or that you, you cover in clinic? Uh, no, I mean, usually it's just, uh, they, they ask pretty much all the questions that have been asked, um, tonight about access. How am I going to feel afterwards? So, all right. I, I can talk about how you're going to feel. There are six treatments, right? The first treatment, you're going to feel like a Mack truck hit you, but you're not going to be in any pain. You're going to be like, Whoa, what happened? And every treatment after that, you feel a ton better. So half of it is anxiety and not knowing what you're gonna, what's gonna happen. And treatments number two through six, the patients do better. They feel better. They recover quick, more quickly. Um, even in the recovery room, when we're taking the catheters out of their groin, they're better. So the, it's a physiologic operation, not a painful operation. So, um, I, uh, you know, it's hard to explain. Expanded access is a um, is a program where the FDA allows us to offer a procedure between the clinical trial results being presented to them and the standard of care product being available. Not every company can produce mass produce the product and have it available in every corner of the country. So, it allows certain centers to still offer the treatment on a protocol that the FDA has approved. It allows the company um, to gather some data still while they are gearing up to roll it out as standard of care. Cleveland Clinic is on the list of wanting to have the procedure um, done. Cedar sinai UCLA, Stanford on the West Coast are three of the centers that are in, in Oregon are three of the centers that are um, uh, on the list that have met with the company that are um, looking forward to offering this. And yes, it's done under general anesthesia. There are some blood pressure swings when we hook the patients up to, um, to the filters and the bypass and all that. So we really need experienced anesthesiologists to kind of mitigate those blood pressure swings. And it has to be done under general anesthesia because of that. Um, all very helpful information. I just want to also um, voice over and echo a comment um, in the in the chat of just appreciation to you, Dr. Zager, for all of the um, cutting edge work that you've done in this area um, to help bring this to patients. Um, and for taking the time to be here um, tonight. And I agree, um, having a patient speak um, is something that you know we want to do soon. And I think to the quality of life piece, um, just a little plug for the vision registry, because that is um, somewhere where we can look at patients um, who have had different treatments and follow quality of life over time and do comparisons. Um, and we have our um, updated data report that will actually be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So um, that's something we could think about um, too. And just um, a lot of thank yous coming in. So just to, no just problem. to echo that. And I want to mention, um, there was a question of where to find this recording um, after we close out tonight. And there will be um, a link to the Melanoma Research Foundation's learning platform um, in the chat. And so this can be um, accessed um, on demand. In, in the future. Um, Dr. Zayer, any closing thoughts tonight before we sort of close can't, out? Can't get the product out there fast enough. Sounds like a lot of people are going to want it, need it, and hopefully it's going to help. Um, it's going to help a lot of people. So I know the, the company is actively 
looking at the as quick as possible to get this um, standard of care, other centers up and running, and it'll happen. Hopefully, again, first quarter of next year is the, is the, is the target, I think. And as those of us who um, are or have lived with um, the influence of this disease, nothing can get out there fast enough. So, um, you know, just just feeling that sense of urgency um, and appreciating you and, and the company and everybody who's working so hard to get this out there for patients and their and their families. So thank you so much, Dr. Zager. Um, and with that, I just have a few notes um, and reminders. Again, um, please be aware of our upcoming support groups that run the first Wednesday of the month and the fourth Friday of the month. These are virtual. And again, as Miriam mentioned, you can reach out to her at education at melanoma.org for more information. And again, please be on the lookout for November's hashtag I Get Dilated campaign. Be sure to interact with us on social media following Cure Melanoma and Cure Ocular Melanoma on Facebook and Twitter. And lastly, um, I hope you'll all save the date for our next in-person patient meeting. Um, this past year, of course, we were down near Dr. Zager um, in Florida. And um, in 2024, May 2nd through 5th, we will be in Boston. And it will be in conjunction with the Miles for Melanoma event um, in Boston. And hopefully we'll have updates um, on a lot of what we discussed here tonight at that time um, as well. Um, at the end of this webinar, there will be an evaluation that will um, pop up in the browser, and we hope you'll fill that out. Um, the more feedback we get from, from you all, the better we can um, orient our programming to, to your needs. And again, please visit us at melanoma.org and curom.org to learn about additional resources or reach out to us at any time. Again, thank you all for joining, and thank you so much for your very thoughtful um, questions. I learned a lot tonight um, from all of you, and thanks again to Dr. Zager. All right. Take care. I'm happy to answer more questions. If you guys get them, you can pass them on to me. Great. Thank you for that. All right.